happening is that the U.S. taxpayers' money is going to support uh, dictatorships, repressive regimes throughout the world, uh, and this U.S. tax money is being used to imprison people, not because they're criminals, but because they happen to oppose the government in power in most of these countries. Uh, U.S. tax money is being used to torture these people, to prevent them from being politically active. Uh, I think foreign aid ought to be used for humanitarian purposes, but not for military aid, nor should it be used to support and prop military dictatorships that undertake this kind of repressive action, that is, imprisoning their own people and torturing them simply for political dissent, political disagreement. That was Senator Deem Zaboresk, one of two few members of Congress who strongly believes that U.S. tax money should not be used for the funding of torture, either direct or indirect. This is Tim McGovern with Taxes for Torture. For the next 60 minutes, we will examine the vast program of counterinsurgency activities in the Western Hemisphere that the United States has developed over the years. By discussing these activities in sanitized language and minimizing their importance, the U.S. government has kept most elements of this program out of public consciousness and relatively invulnerable to criticism. This counterinsurgency network has been called the first line of defense and is capable of controlling situations that would otherwise destabilize repressive governments in Latin America that are under U.S. control. It's made up of groups like the Green Berets and Latin American military and police forces who have been developed, trained, equipped, and indoctrinated by the Office of Public Safety, which works out of the Agency for International Development. Senate hearings on the so-called public safety programs culminated with this conclusion by a staff assistant of the Senate Committee on Western Hemisphere Affairs. Pat M. Holt said, quote, the United States is politically identified with police terrorism. Political terrorism has become a necessary tool in keeping pro-U.S. governments in power throughout the Third World. For some background on AID's public safety programs, we go to Michael Clare. He's a staff member of the North American Congress on Latin America and author of the book War Without End, American Planning for the Next Vietnam. Michael Clare. AIT had two programs. One of them was the public safety program. The other is the International Police Academy. And the public safety program was, in, was a massive program of uh, training police all over the world uh, in their own country, and as well as arming them and advising them and giving them money. It also runs the International Police Academy in Washington, D.C., in 1961, AID set up a bureau inside AID called the Office of Public Safety, or OPS, which had the specific function of providing assistance to police departments in undeveloped countries, third world countries. And this agency, OPS, was tasked with the job of providing training in those countries by sending public safety advisors that was their official title, capital letters, public safety advisors, to each country to provide training on the spot to, to people there and to advise the police chiefs and the police commanders in each of those countries directly. Uh, it was also set up to provide equipment like riot control equipment and computers and weapons to police departments in those countries and to administer the International Police Academy in Washington, D.C. At the height of the program, uh, in 1970, there were 400 U.S. public safety advisors scattered around the world, including about 200 in South Vietnam and about 10 each in each Latin American country. Police advisors are primarily involved in Latin America in shoring up the, the counterinsurgency potential of the police forces. Latin American history professor Timothy Harding, California State University, Los Angeles. And there have been dramatic instances of that, which the movie State of Siege, for instance, is made about Dan Mitrioni, in who was first in Belo Horizonte, Brazil, where he was advisor to 
the most vicious, uh, at that time, center for torturing political prisoners. And then he was uh, uh, moved from Belo Horizonte in Minas Gerais, Brazil, to Uruguay, where he advised on the tactic against the Tupamaros in Uruguay, and uh, that resulted in his kidnapping, and, and finally the, the story is made available to the American public in the form of the movie State of Siege. The U.S. was also training people to set up police academies in those countries, uh, and we would provide uh, teachers for those schools as well, so that um, even though uh, the International Police Academy has only trained about 4,000 top police officials, uh, the public safety program as a whole claims to have provided training to over a million foreign policemen. The International Police Academy provides training to only the highest ranking police officials of foreign countries. Courses are offered by the U.S. Treasury Department, the Post Office, Border Patrolling is taught by the Bureau of Immigration and Naturalization, and the FBI offers a field trip to their crime lab. Another excursion takes the students to the CIA's Special Warfare Center at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Michael Clare listed some other training provided at the International Police Academy. Programs range from uh, ordinary so-called police work, like uh, traffic management and all that kind of stuff, up and to and including intelligence work, counterinsurgency, they have a program to train police how to make bombs and how to use assassination weapons. They train them in investigation of mail. There have been courses in prison management. Um, the, every aspect of police work, the emphasis being on counterinsurgency, intelligence work, counter-gullet operations, sort of the political side of police work. The public safety program is police aid to um, most Latin American countries, even those that do not at the moment have political dictatorships. Um, and um, the public safety program uh, the, it, it officially tries to disguise the counterinsurgency nature of that program. They emphasize, you know, it's nothing but teaching people how to direct traffic. The insulting thing about that is that the United States should even pretend that they have to go down to another Latin American country to teach somebody to control traffic. As if, you know, as if people were so dumb they couldn't figure out how to do that for themselves. What they really do help them with is, um, is, is the computerization of police activities. And the primary justification for the massive amounts of money put into police aid is certainly not because parking is snarled up in downtown Rio de Janeiro. It is only justified in terms of its counterinsurgency role. One of the people who went through the training is the director of SAVAK, S-A-V-A-K, in Iran, which is the uh, secret police force working directly for the Shah of Iran, which is known to have murdered 60 political activists in the past few years, as well as torturing uh, many hundreds of others. That man was trained at the International Police Academy. Uh, many of the leaders of the Carabineros of Chile, which is the paramilitary national police force, were trained there. The uh, director of intelligence and security of the government of Costa Rica, the chief of the police in, Dom in the Dominican Republic, was trained at the International Police Academy. And the police in the Dominican Republic are also have been cited uh, for their uh, barbaric practices, including assassination of anti-government leaders uh, and uh, all kinds of repression and brutality. I feel that the International Police Academy serves a very definite need for those countries that are not able to provide satisfactory training for their police forces, and the elimination of it eliminates a... Uh, a service which the United States can render uh, to countries that are not capable of this type of training. Quinn Tom, head of the International Association of Chiefs of Police. I think that it also is an excellent public relations or uh, friendly gesture towards the people, or especially of uh, those countries that, that do take part in the International Police Academy.
Is this also the purpose of creating goodwill among law enforcement agencies throughout the world? And everybody will be happy. The real reason, so far as I could see, is to suppress radical and revolutionary political movements at a very early stage in their development so that a large revolutionary movement doesn't develop and threaten the client governments that the United States is installed in most of these countries. Because once you have a full-scale revolutionary movement, like you do in Vietnam, nothing is going to save the client except intervention by the United States with regular troops. And this is something that the United States just cannot afford at this time. It can't afford it economically, and it can't afford it politically. So by building up local police forces as a first line of defense against insurrection and rebellion, the White House, the government, hopes to make it unnecessary for U.S. troops to intervene abroad to save right-wing governments that it's set up there. The police and military aid given to Latin America by the U.S. government is, uh, comes out of our taxes. And... Most people in the United States are not aware that the money that's collected from them is going to support repressive regimes in the most literal sense, actually, to, re to support the oppression itself, the training of the torturers, the, the equipping of them, and the sophisticated equipment that they use in their counterinsurgency activities. I'm talking about computers that can be hooked up to uh, wiretaps of telephones throughout the country so that there's a computerized monitoring telephone calls throughout the country to to uh, to detect conversations that might be related you know to guerrilla activity and the processing of nearly the entire population through computer banks to identify those people who by various characteristics can be shown to be more likely to be susceptible to revolutionary activity. You know, maybe they belong to a union and their mother was this and they've been through this grade of education and they've read such and such books and so on. Then the police begins to process these, this group of high likelihood, you know, one by one. They call them in, they question them, they put police agents on their tail and so on. And all these um, highly sophisticated techniques are made available to otherwise underdeveloped countries by United States money and United States technical aid. And we're paying for this. And the people of the United States should should become aware of how their money is spent so that they can call their own government to account and, and say whether or not this is the way they want the money to be spent. The fact is that our tax money is being sent on aid to repressive regimes. The question now is why? Why would it be advantageous to the United States to keep in power governments that imprison and torture their populace simply for political disagreement. To date, according to government figures, the United States has put approximately $100 million worth of military aid in South America, apparently the aim of crushing the guerrilla movements there. Why is the United States so concerned with these revolutionaries? We asked Michael Clare. So the whole U.S. free world system, so-called, uh, the capitalist system on a global basis depends on having unlimited access to markets and raw material sources in all of these countries. The, the system as a whole can't survive without, without access to most of the third world. And a revolutionary movement which would take power and um, set up its own priorities for its use of its natural resources would threaten the, the prosperity in a uh, functioning of, of the U.S. world system. Latin America matters to us because it is our, our sole or our major source or supply for certain key strategic raw materials, manganese, copper, tin, and, and others. International Relations and Political Science Professor Michael Fleet, University of Southern California. Uh, it is also important to us because of its growing population size, and therefore its its capacity to absorb excess domestic production. The United States economic system in, in, inevitably produces. Uh, we, we, we need outlets uh, for that excess production. Well, in addition to this general need, then, that Latin America 
satisfies of the U.S. economy as a whole, it is also an extremely important economic resource for individual uh, economic uh, companies, corporations, multinational corporations based in the United States, uh, for example, in many instances draw on Latin America for more than 50% of their overall revenues. Low wages, some kind of government stability, whether it's repressive or not, they don't care, is uh, profitable to them, and they want to keep it that way. South Dakota's Democratic Senator James Aberesk. Multinational corporations based in this country have always had a large voice in U.S. foreign policy. That kind of foreign policy is against the interests of the majority of the people in the United States. Latin America absorbs in profitable investment in the neighborhood of $18 billion a year, which is an appreciable uh, amount of money and, and underlies the economic importance that America has to the United States. Uh, in addition to this economic importance, there is the strategic or the military importance. And, and that, I think, is perhaps best uh, characterized by referring to the traditional Monro doctrine of the United States has pursued with respect to Latin America. Uh, the declaration was made in the first part of the 9th century, and it said essentially that the United States would regard as a direct threat to its own integrity uh, any attempt by European power to gain a foothold in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, we want to keep Latin America free from uh, penetration by our international rivals. We regard it as our sphere of influence, as important to us for the economic reasons I've described and for, for military reasons as well. You could mention such things as the Panama Canal and, and uh, the control to the South Pacific and so forth. And in this regard, it is important for us to have in control of the economic and political policy-making processes throughout the continent in the various countries People who are, who are sympathetic to our views share our perspectives on a global military or strategic uh, level and who are willing to continue to supply us with the materials, the raw materials we need at the prices that we uh, are prepared to pay or can, who are willing to continue to afford us access to their domestic market for this uh, uh, excess production we, we have problems getting rid of from time to time. In other words, they're pretty receptive to suggestions from our State Department. Uh, any non-aligned country or any popular government, of course, is going to be independent from 100% uh, of the wishes of our State Department, so therefore it's in the interest of uh, probably of our high administration officials to have these governments there who will listen to them and who are dependent upon them. Today we prop up uh, governments that are themselves economically weak enhance their political strength in the process, and we similarly uh, prop up governments that are militarily weak, that is weak in, in the uh, maintaining of internal security and, and stability. Decent policing in the third world is uh, helpful to the development of stable economic and social institutions. And this is particularly true of, of conservative governments that are opposed uh, strongly by uh, working class organizations, peasant organizations, or uh, the civilian political uh, establishment uh, generally. Uh, the economic aid that is administered by the United States under a very clearly discriminatory criteria, uh, where, where aid is given to those governments who will comply uh, with U.S. policy, uh, the long-term assistance or support for the government question may well be much more substantial uh, uh, in its impact. With the United States support, they don't need any internal support. They can have a very narrow popular base. That's enough to sustain them in power if their foreign debts are paid for them by loans, if their military equipment is donated, if their sophisticated equipment to to be able to block the opposition movements is made available and how to use it is made available by the United States. To those governments uh, which are under more direct and immediate uh, assault or attack or, or, or opposition from the outside, we, we tend to offer direct military aid in the form of, of equipment, uh, police and, and paramilitary equipment. In Chile, the uh, Department of Defense provides aid to the, to the Chilean defense ministry, which includes the Carabineros, the paramilitary police force, which was involved in the coup. Allende was uh, uh, appropriating American properties 
in, uh, uh, in that country. California's Republican Congressman Charles Wiggins. And uh, substantial American investments were in jeopardy. That's a concern to this country. Uh, and I'm uh, personally uh, more satisfied that the present government is more than the United States than the Allende government. Uh, in, in some instances, this, this uh, military assistance takes the form of, of sophisticated uh, torture equipment, a variety of, of different kinds of weapons, bombs, anti-personnel guns, things like this, that are used... Uh, uh, to be used discreetly and clandestinely by the, by the uh, national police force or by the military uh, of the particular country. Uh, there's also, of course, the, the more visible uh, kind of military aid that is the supply of the more conventional sorts of, of weapons, airplanes, uh, credit for the purchase of, of conventional guns and, and things like that. In, in this general area of military aid, which clearly uh, strengthens the hand of repressive governments in Latin America, it should be noted that the, the level of aid, certainly the, the, the amount of, of aid channeled through official sources has declined in recent years. Professor Fleet was talking about aid that was officially recorded, but there are factions of our government whose activities aren't always recorded, let alone officially. Don Marks, co-author of CIA Cult of Intelligence, gave an example at a congressional hearing. Now the CIA specializes in having clean arms, uh, arms that can't be um, traced. There's a company over here in, in Alexandria called Inner Arm Co., which is the largest private arms manufacturer in the world. It's under Samuel Cummings, a former CIA man. He's got warehouses over there in Alexandria the war, on the waterfront, full of these arms. And CIA and the private arms dealings who deal with CIA have a lot of these facilities and have to make a connection. I'm not privy to, to special information. I know of no... no uh, uh, operative channels through which something like that would pass. It certainly does, and it's true because the material shows up at the other end, but exactly how it's done, I don't know, and I suppose if I did know, I'd be in trouble. I suppose if I did know, I'd be in trouble. I suppose if I did know, I'd be in trouble. Come get out of the way, boy. Quick, get out of the way. You'd better watch what you say, boy. Better watch what you say. We'll smash down your doors. We don't bother to knock. We've done it before, so why all the shock? We're the biggest and the toughest kids on the block. And we're the cops of the world, boy. We're the cops of the world. Our boots are needing a shine, boy. Boots are needing a shine. But our Coca Cola is fine, boy. Coca Cola is fine. We'll spit through the streets of the cities we wreck. And we'll find you a leader that you can elect. The treaties we signed were a pain in the neck. Cause we're the cops of the world, boys We're the cops of the world And when we butchered your sons, boys When we butchered your sons Have a stick of our gum, boys Have a stick of our bubble gum We don't have the world Say, can you see? And the name for our prophets is democracy. So, like it or not, you will have to be free. Cause we're the cops of the world, boys. We're the cops of the world. Most of the policing equipment and techniques used in Latin America were tested and perfected by the United States and Vietnam. Senator Abarest discussed one of the most horrifying of these techniques, torture. Although Quinn Tum, head of the International Association of Chiefs of Police, disagrees, Senator Abarest contends the students at the International Police Academy at least become familiar with this. It's obvious that there is some discussion of uh, the uses of torture during the classes. I don't know where the Senate, upon what the Senate basis is. 
this allegation. That is not the purpose of the academy, and that is not what I have seen the academy teaching. Now, if they're doing that, they may be doing it late at night. We found uh, some theses, graduate papers, written by some of the students that uh, talk about torture using much of the same language throughout all the various theses, so it's obvious that torture had been discussed. That's ridiculous to, uh, to think that the school conducted by our State Department would be involved in the teaching of training of, training of uh, torture. No, I just don't believe this. They don't have to train people in the use of torture. They're, they're all sophisticated enough to know that those people are going to use torture in those countries and that they're perfectly capable of, of learning the techniques themselves. The job of the police academy is, is to train people in methodologies and skills and, and this sort of thing. And, and the instructors know that uh, the police are going to use these skills and methodologies, um, you know, as they see fit. And they have a common political orientation, so they know who's going to be the targets and victims of those skills. But they don't, you know, they don't say, here's how you go about torturing anyone. Now, we know that they have that uh, bomb school in Texas, at Los Fresnos, Texas, where the CIA trains policemen in... Uh, the use of homemade bombs and assassination weapons and uh, explosives and things like that. And I'm sure that when they train people, they say, listen, here's the equipment and here's the skills, and you guys know what, what to do with it. But they don't, they, they don't ever be specific about that. Let's take a look at the Latin American countries with large numbers of political prisoners. The country whose abuses of prisoners has received perhaps the largest amount of public attention and a substantive amount of U.S. aid is Chile. When the Chilean council was asked about these abuses, he blamed overseas interrogators operating in Chile and the people who had been arrested. High government officials freely acknowledge there have been abused against suspects by overseas interrogators. But they point to extenuating circumstances, including sniping against police and soldiers, and an emotional climate of class hatred by the max militants. Perhaps more important, I found no evidence that the top military authorities ever ordered or approved the abuse of suspects. As for political prisoners? They are not political prisoners. In the first days, there were many people detained not taking prisoners, but in as much as each individual clarified his positions, they were feed, and only the well-known masses leaders, accused of common crimes, were left under custody. It's ridiculous. Um, uh, th that many thousands of people uh, are supposed to have been engaging in some kind of common criminal activities it just doesn't make any sense. Professor Harding. It's obvious. To any observer, um, and this has been made clear in interviews with U.S. officials, and you, you've probably heard that even the U.S. ambassador, who's totally in support of the regime down there, was raising the issue of uh, political prisoners and the use of torture in talks with the Chilean government and was slapped on the wrist by kissing her for doing it. So it shows that the U.S. ambassador is perfectly aware that these people are not in jail for um, for criminal activities. I think it's even more important to realize that these people were not arrested because they were engaging in political opposition. They didn't even give them a chance. They arrested them because they knew from their connection with the former government that if given a chance, they probably would oppose the government. And so because they supposed they would oppose the government, that's why they were arrested. They were arrested because they were on lists uh, by police lists, intelligence lists, gathered by the United States, by the Chilean government, by the Brazilian Secret Service in Chile. And um, these are the people that the government is calling common criminal. So, according to Professor Harding, the Chilean government has used American and Brazilian practices and personnel. Well, Martin Hall of Coalition for the Restoration of Democracy in Chile says the Chilean junta has also used some of the practices and personnel of the Third Reich. There will be a parallel between the methods 
that Hitler and the Nazis used in Germany in 1933 to establish their fascist dictatorship, and which are used, almost copied, step by step, by the junta in Chile. Perhaps 20,000 people were killed after the coup, and there's no telling how many political prisoners are being held. The government um, announced in September that they were going to release those political prisoners who were being held simply for opposition to the government and only hold those guilty of the most heinous crimes and so on. As far as I know, they've only released about 50 to 75 people, and they were holding several thousand. So that that was, um, you know, a phony move designed to sort of throw people off the track of the continued use of political imprisonment and torture. There was also a report by one of the people who are lucky enough to escape from one of the concentration camps, that the prisoners were so tortured constantly that several of them had gone insane in the meantime. They were put into small cubicles of not more than four feet square, not only one but two or three, and held there without water, without food, and many of them have lost their mind. I do not know. Uh of any internal policies which deprive uh, citizens of a country of, of their human rights. Congressman Wiggins. But that is not to say that because of my opposition to that policy, I'm prepared to uh, advocate that that government be overthrown and be replaced by one which is adverse to the interest of the United States. Uh, the proper solution to an internal problem is for the people of that country to correct it internally. Girls have been raped in the camps by the guards. Those who have become sick, especially those in the northern part of Chile, in the southern part of Chile, in the Antarctic, who were sent to a camp that is absolutely impossible to live there in Arctic conditions, again without any aid, medical or otherwise. The Human Rights Commission of the Organization of the American States was visiting some of the concentration camps, but not the three most ominous ones when we know that tortures find, uh, took place every day. We were reporting that 222 opponents of the junta and former loyalist supporters of Allende had been executed without trial. We had a, a hostile communist government in, uh, uh, in Chile, hostile to the interest of the United States, and what it was uh, uh, practicing the, uh, uh, the international league acceptable, perhaps, uh, part of uh, confiscating American property, but uh, we don't have to, to be enthusiastic about that. A man who was a close colleague of Adolf Eichmann, a man who was responsible personally for the killing of at least 97,000 Jewish people, a man who was, as an SS colonel, inventing before they had the gas ovens in the concentration camps, he invented the so-called gas tanks tanks into which prisoners were herded and that were then hermetically sealed and the exhaust fumes from the, from the running motors were directed into the tanks. It took usually 15 minutes for about 50 people to die. The men who invented them and the men who was in charge of them, the men who organized the first scientific mass killing under Hitler, has been appointed by General Pinochet, by the head of the junta, to supervise the administration of prisons, especially the treatment of the political prisoners. This man now is a government official. And what we should not forget is that he is an official of a government that is recognized by the United States, a government for which you and my taxpayer money is being spent in military and financial aid to the junta, Personally, uh, more satisfied that the present government is more than the United States was the Allende government. We not only have to overthrow Allende, we have poured hundreds of millions of dollars ever since the coup into Chile in order to make a success of this fascist government, which we are sure is protecting the interests of whatever American investors have their capital invested in Chile or will invest it. I don't know, of my own knowledge, what role the United States played. I understand that it was uh, uh, 
covert and that we lend some support to opposition candidates to President Allende. The Chilean government not only stays in power because of continued U.S. aid, but it got there because of U.S. aid to forces that overthrew the Chilean government. The United States, I'm told, and I have no reason to doubt that, did not mastermind a coup in that country that resulted in the overthrow of Allende. I mean, the United States, as we know, poured money into the truckers' strike and into uh, military aid and into uh, counterinsurgency coordinating um, during Allende's regime, which made it possible for the government to come into power, and then now continues to aid that regime to stabilize it and control. In order to get information on the mistreatment of political prisoners in other Latin American countries, we went to Amnesty International. Amnesty is a London-based pacifist organization which tries to obtain due process of law for people who are imprisoned solely for their political beliefs. Dave Boxall reads excerpts from their report on countries with substantial numbers of political prisoners, countries which all receive U.S. military and police aid. In Argentina, Amnesty International has documented 73 methods of torture. Some of them are the electric prod, used for shocking various parts of the body, the telephone, which consists of beating prisoners from behind on both ears, causing temporary or sometimes permanent deafness, and the parrot perch. That's a combination of hanging, near drowning in filthy water, and multiple electric shocks simultaneously. Some of the most refined torture equipment in the world is used by a group of Argentine debts led and organized by some of the country's top military officers. Amnesty International's report on Haiti says, it's rather obvious that there are several basic human rights problems, a total lack of proceedings after arrest, and no subsequent contact with either family, lawyer, or priest. And families are not even informed when a prisoner has died in detention. Amnesty has received a report of one prisoner, a lawyer, who was released and seen in public. Two weeks later, he was rearrested, and has not been heard of since. Lawyers have been themselves arrested and tortured for failing to uh, give the government information uh, uh, like interviews that they had with their clients, privileged information that a lawyer in no country is required to give. And if lawyers continue to defend political prisoners, they're put in jail on trumped-up charges and themselves tortured and held without charge. So that it discourages anyone from, you know, giving a, an adequate legal defense to these people. There are a number of political prisoners in Colombia who have been charged with rebellion and association commit a criminal offense. Others have been detained for allegedly having links to the extreme left-wing National Liberation Army. At the end of December 1973, when state of siege was finally lifted, the Colombian Supreme Court declared that these prisoners should no longer be tried by the military tribunals. They were reportedly released soon afterwards, However, they too had been subjected to tortures. Also, the lawyers for these prisoners had been excluded from trial proceedings and some had been threatened. Amnesty International has received regular reports from Guatemala of persons who disappear without a trace. The authorities claim that these people have left the country on their own accord and the investigations into their whereabouts continue. However, due to the unsatisfactory results of these investigations, Amnesty International recommended that the government set up an impartial commission of inquiry. This recommendation has never been heeded. There are hundreds of these missing persons cases, and in each one there have been charges that the police and military have taken part in the abductions. The nature of the victims, varying from people showing left-wing sympathies to petty criminals, and the fact that the bodies found show evident signs of torture point to the existence of death squads. As a matter of fact, sometimes a death squad card is left on these bodies. One of the death squad victims was the Christian Democrat candidate for the mayor of a provincial town. He was one of the 50 bodies recently found in a disused well. In October of 1973, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights 
asked to set its own impartial team of inquiry to investigate. The Guatemala government refused. This considerable amount of information on uh, on torture and imprisonment in Guatemala has been going on in, in the most incredible way um, ever since the United States helped overthrow the government in 1954. The author of an Amnesty International report on prison conditions in Paraguay spent three weeks there interviewing leaders of the three main opposition parties. He also talked with lawyers, journalists, priests, and social workers. According to the investigator, there is no doubt that torture is and has been the usual means of gaining confessions and money from the prisoners. In his report, Amnesty's representative said that torture in Paraguay often ends in death and is carried out in the presence of top police officials. The techniques usually witnessed by the army generals include physical brutality and the sexual abuse of women prisoners. The victims are often only relatives to suspected communists. The actual suspects are usually disposed of by the government. There is also a growing repression of students and farmers in Paraguay. They are arrested arbitrarily and subject to brutal treatment. Several students were arrested and refused due process of law. They weren't arrested for major offenses, simply for being connected with slogans painted on street walls, the slogans protesting the government's economic policies. Many of these governments would not have taken power without U.S. support and assurance before they took power, that after they were in power, that they would get total U.S. support. For instance, the military probably would not have been able to agree and coordinate on having the coup to ask the Gulag government in Brazil in 1964, had it not been for the previous support and assurance given by the military attaches of the United States, the U.S. ambassador, and so on that once they are through the government, that the aid which had been withheld to Brazil would immediately be made available in large quantities and the United States would see them through the economic difficulties of stabilizing the oppressive regime after they took over. Amnesty International has received countless reports of Brazil political prisoners being tortured. Official permission to carry out investigations has been denied. In 1972, Amnesty prepared a statement on Brazilian torture allegation. It was based on reports from eyewitnesses, lawyers, journalists, and others. Their documents showed clear evidence of physical, mental, and sexual abuse. Prisoners are often forced to watch their family and friends being tortured. The Brazilian government responded to the report by imposing a new press law, bidding the publication of Amnesty International statements in Brazil. Amnesty concluded that torture is widespread administrative practice used in most police and military interrogations. The Brazilian forces have their own interrogation centers, which are directed by the Department for Public Safety. In hearings before a United States Congressional Subcommittee on Aid to Brazil, allegations were raised concerning possible U.S. involvement with the Brazilian torches. In the case of Bolivia, the United States and Brazil together organized the overthrow of the, of the Bolivian government in 1971 and continued to support that government in power. In regards to the abuse of opponents to Bolivia's military government, Amnesty International has received a document entitled Evangelism and Violence. It was published by 99 members of the Bolivian Church and denounced what it termed the physical and morally degrading tortures, including the rape of some women prisoners. According to other documents, most tortures are carried out shortly after arrest in the Criminal Investigation Department and in the Ministry of the Interior. As a matter of fact, high-ranking officers of the Interior Ministry have personally conducted and advised in the tortures. Amnesty International's report on the Dominican Republic says the most elementary human rights have consistently been violated and that all political opposition has been suppressed. Allegations included numerous political assassinations carried out by death squads with the open support of the national police. Amnesty has received photographs of prisoners with severe lesions from torture sessions. 
Techniques like constant beating and nocturnal interrogation have been used by the Secret Service. She brutality is common in the national prison. High-ranking officers in the National Police Force have frequently been accused of complicity in and responsibility for the torture. Uruguay's urban guerrilla movement, the Tupamaros, have led the government to methods of repression in their attempt to control the rebels. Torture is a routine procedure after the arrest of a Tupamaro suspect or sympathizer. The prisoners are blindfolded to prevent identification of the torturer. Con techniques used are standing with legs apart for many hours or days, or tying the prisoner to a plank and submerging him in water. Reports received by Amnesty International allege that advisors from the United States and Brazil are training Uruguayan police in counterinsurgency methods which include the use of torture. The purpose of the torture is to extract confessions from suspected guerrillas. However, many citizens not affiliated with the Tupamaros invariably become victims of arrest and torture. Since Uruguay has abandoned constitutional government even before when they were constitutional government before they instituted their dictatorship there, there were large numbers of political prisoners and political terror was used against the, the left, not simply the Tupamaros, but the Communist Party and other groups on the left that did not even advocate taking armed action, but advocated, you know, participating in elections and so on. And they were um, frequently arrested and uh, the government shot up their headquarters and so on. They were hauled in on suspected charges of this and that and tortured. <laughs> Amnesty International believes that many political prisoners in Ecuador have given confessions while in pain to torture. They have received testimony from one prisoner denouncing extreme physical tortures that drove him to the verge of suicide. Another man, a journalist and writer, was found guilty of planning a bank robbery. The legal grounds for his conviction was a confession, a confession extracted under torture. It seems that the real reason for his arrest was his support of Ecuador's Socialist Party, and his writings. He has often criticized corruption of Ecuadorian politicians. The taking of political prisoners is, is, um, is not simply an aspect of repression of guerrilla movements. It's part of the, the general political control of the society. A very large number of these political prisoners never engaged in armed action against their country. It's very common to simply arrest people and hold them for a long period of time, torture them, um, and simply not release them for years at a time. In Venezuela, according to Amnesty International, political opponents have disappeared under strange circumstances, some while on detention. Torches are allegedly carried out by high-ranking intelligence service officers. According to testimony received by Amnesty International, tortures include electric shock through the use of a field telephone, prolonged exposure in a tiger hole, beatings, burnings, and simulated executions. The torturers are military personnel. The accounts of torture you have just heard were all taken from reports published by Amnesty International. The fact is that uh, Amnesty International's uh, information about political prisoners is, is more than conservatively uh, accurate. I mean, they don't print information when they don't have confirmed cases. And they admit, and I am convinced, that the situation is much worse than how they portray it, because there are thousands of cases about which they can't get enough information one way or another to be able to list it as a confirmed case. Uh, you know, like a mysterious disappearance. And then there are rumors that the person's being held in a certain place. But uh, who, who can get there to find out? One way of obtaining this information is through correspondence with people who live in these countries and are privy to reports of this type. Senator Abareth has received some of these counts. This is a letter I got uh, in November of 1973 from a woman who lives in Thailand. She's talking about women in Vietnam that she has interviewed personally. 
and she's talking now about uh, a widow, 32 years old, Mrs. Nagoyan T. Non, from Saigon, and she was arrested in an anti tu demonstration where she was demanding, uh, quote, peace, freedom, stop the draft for the right to live. And she was first brought to Quan Number 3 Police Station in Saigon. She was there a week, and police damaged her vagina with an iron stick and gave her an electric shock. They also forced soapy water into her mouth and then pounded on her stomach. She was then transferred to Quan Number to Six, Quan number police, six station. police Station, and she recalls the chief torturer in that station as a man named Nam Lung. And uh, she asks that uh, the Senate should demand to see a list of all South Vietnamese police trained in the United States. She says she believes there will be at least 64 in the International Police Academy this year. That means 1973. But here at the second place, she was tied to a ceiling, beaten by four policemen, policemen electric, electric shocked, shocked again, and had another iron stick inserted into her vagina. She bled a great deal and lost consciousness. After a week of no food or water, sitting in a cell with a tight rubber bandage over her head, Mrs. Nan was transferred to police headquarters. The police there told her that the three U.S. men uniformed present at her torture were CIA agents. Mrs. Nan told me that two Americans watched and one participated with the Vietnamese police. This one American ordered the Vietnamese police to put nails under her fingernails. She said that he also beat her on the ears and then told the Vietnamese police to force her to stand with a light bulb shining close to her eyes for several days. After ten days, she was tortured again, when ten Vietnamese police beat her up and sexually abused her. Mrs. An told me she saw several pregnant women at police headquarters who miscarried because of their tortures. And then I've got another letter from uh, two of my constituents out in South Dakota. Uh, let me read the excerpts from this letter. My wife and I spent the summer in eastern Bolivia. Stories of torture and execution under the Banzer dictatorship circulate freely. We spent a few days in Uruguay, where we lived as Mennonite missionary teachers for many years with our son and daughter-in-law. We visited two friends, one a Methodist minister and seminary teacher, the other also a Methodist minister, who were just recently freed from prison. Their stories of torture such as near drowning, electrical shock while underwater with an instrument inserted in the rectum, the occasions of having been placed in front of a firing squad, blindfolded, to try and get them to implicate others, and so forth, were almost unbelievable. Especially in what was only a few short years ago, a land of absolute freedom of expression, the Switzerland of South America. At least one of the torturers told one of our friends that he had learned his technique in a special American school in the Canal Zone. An American missionary friend who was tortured for four days before his release insists that at least one American was involved in the torture squad. Although I dare not mention names, it would be easy for me to document what has happened and is happening. Must we support this sort of regime in Latin America and Africa? How far are we from the same kind of police state? This is dated June 27, 1974. Uh, the informant we have was a young leader in a large and uh, proud union of forestry workers. This is what came to us from uh, somebody in Chile. The union leaders, plus radio equipment, plus at least plus 600, 600 deserters, organized five months of armed guerrilla activity, both east and west of Orsono. He told a tragic tale of the violence and oppression which I'm sure the outside world well knows by now. What I'm compelled to add is a tale of a United States advisor's card. Between the 28th and 30th of November, about 200 Hunter troops were pursuing a small band of eight resistors. One of the eight was captured and could be heard crying out under torture. His companions returned to save him. They observed 12 Hunter soldiers practicing a system of torture and death. The victim was nearly nude, tied to a teeter-totter plank above a drum of water. His head end would be doused, while hot coals would be applied to his legs. When half drowned, he would be revived and questioned. A man without insignia, talking good Spanish without an accent, was giving orders to another. 
with lieutenant's insignia. The guerrillas attacked, rescued their dying friend, and killed the hunt soldiers. A closer inspection of the man without insignia revealed a man 36 to 39 years of age, flat top butch haircut, light complexion, left arm tattoo, and right arm tattoo. In his shirt pocket, there was an identification card issued to advisors. On one side was an Anglo-Saxon name. The card read, Servicio Internacional Militare Tarsita de Investigación Asesor. One of the Hunt soldiers admitted before he died that all in the squad had shared in the torture. The place was east of Orsono. The victim died of infection and blood loss. His chest was sliced by a sharp blade. His testicles were crushed. A large branch had been shoved deep into his rectum. After an investigation of this last letter, Pacifica's Paz Cohen discovered additional information. Photocopies of the card and the story reached Washington, but checks by congressional offices came up with Defense Department denials of the man's existence. There has been no definitive denial from the CIA. The dead soldier's bodies were searched, and the U.S. military ID card was found on the one who had seemed to be directing the interrogation. Card identified him as Charles Starley, advisor, service of military intelligence, and bore a serial number and a series of letters. The card also said both Army of Chile and U.S. Army come practice in military attaché offices. At least two congressional offices have asked the Defense Department about Charles Starley, and both have been told no one by that name is in the Army records. Members of the 5th Estate Counterspy Office in Washington say chances are great that the name was either false or that the Pentagon removed Starley's record. There is also the possibility, they say, that Starley was a CIA operative. In response to evidence of U.S. complicity with torture on an international scale, Senator Adresk has presented a bill to Congress that would cut off funds to institutions like the International Police Academy and would prohibit the training of foreign police in the United States. However, even if this amendment is adopted, its effectiveness is questionable. There are lots of ways in which the government can get around such an amendment. Michael Clare. By uh, channeling money through the military appropriation. Uh, which, which was not covered by the amendment. That just means someone else will have to do something of the IAPC to assess the uh, police departments who are in the training programs where they have not invested as far as we have in this country. Train could be provided by the International Association of Chiefs of Police, the IACP, which is, has its headquarters in Washington, D.C., also, uh, police equipment corporations like Smith & Wesson and uh, companies like that could um, sell weapons and provide training their use. And then another thing to look for is the incredible expansion of the private police companies like uh, Wackenhut Incorporated and um, uh, Pinkerton and Burns Guards, all of these companies are opening offices all over the third world to provide protection for U.S. corporations that have plants in those countries. And I'm certain that uh, these companies uh, will expand their work to include uh, training guards and so forth in those countries. And so, just as the war in Indochina continues, the war in Latin America will continue. The war without end. This program is produced at KPFK, Pacifica Radio Los Angeles, by David Morrison, myself, Tim McGovern. Technical assistance by R.H. Bob Lowe and T.G. U.S. taxpayers' money ought to be used for humanitarian purposes but not for military aid, nor should be used to support and prop up military dictatorships that undertake this kind of repressive action, that is, imprisoning their own people and torturing them simply for political dissent, political disagreement.